Hello everyone, today we talk about Maurian infantry between the 4th and the 2nd century BC. We already made a video on the Maurian army organization, at some point we will talk about specifically the Indian tactics of the time. Today we take a look specifically to the, let's say, we could say the average Indian infantryman in this period which is a challenge because uh, India is uh, a huge system in this sense and we have also a, a relative difficulty in the reconstruction as naturally in this wide uh, theater the, uh, the the sources the documentation differs wildly as also the political and social systems differed in substance and there, there would be a lot to tell before starting a video like this, but we'll skip it, making it perhaps in an, for another video, the one on tactics especially. Also, today we'll talk specifically about literally the average Indian infantryman, that is to say, uh, not about the Indian armored infantryman that uh, we have uh, information on, and we'll take a look fundamentally on this main accounts uh, the one from the 4th century description of Alexander's Admiral Nearchus, preserved in Arians Indica, right, and one of the, one of the 1st century BC reliefs from Sanchi, right, in, in India, that um, indicate, uh, on the base of other scattered evidence, that equipment changed little throughout this era and, and beyond but also substantial differences compared to other uh, areas like Persia or the Hellenistic world that now enters also at its gates. And um, the the picture generally here is that the northern Indians were descending from the Aryan invaders who had imposed themselves on the previous population. Naturally by now, uh, we're talking about lots of centuries before, uh, the, the population was by now largely homogeneous, right? And uh, they were fairly tall and fairly, uh, and also light skinned in a way. The, the Hellenic writers compared them to the Egyptians, right? And there might have might have been some uh, different look, tendentially in the lower classes because of this ancient reminiscence of this mm, very harsh, actually, uh, Aryan. Vedic domination, and you know that India in this um, Indo-European uh, context is a land where you can steal actually a lot of of uh, in fact of the Aryan legacy even in certain moral values that at this point were also trying to be countered for the sake of the construction of a more centralized uh, power during the Mauryans. Think about Ashoka, right? That tried fundament that basically converted. To, uh, to to Buddhism, and uh, this was, uh, you know, uh, an attempt to f fundamentally centralize on the base of major cities and trying to oust the um, the rural aristocracies that instead were, you know, fundamentally Brahminic in, in, uh, from, from a religious point of view, and um, were developing all this kind of uh, aristocratic ethos also or defining it better, right, because also this had an evolution over time. The codification at some point was uh, was was not mm, clearly outlined. Um, and uh, this also presents uh, uh, difficulties to for, for the reconstruction, for example, of the, the tactics proper, because the certain documents, like such as the Arta Sharta, is this poem that um, it, it's a political tree say treated in a ways um but it contains a lot of this moral even chivalric ideas that are depicting uh an Indian warfare that we have difficulties also to to properly picture otherwise uh, because we don't have so many different sources after all and that is is highly ideal right in nature it does sound like the Mahabharata for example a chivalric epic in a way and this um, uh, let's say a bit like you find in the West indeed the, the, the for example that there is the centrality of the hero and also the the condemnation of certain uh, what were considered as unfair means right but we'll see that the, 
as in the West, uh, the, the, the Indian political practice was as brutal as it could be. Naturally, here I'm bridging, I don't know, ancient and medieval, but uh, this is also a uh, an important topic to discuss relatively to the broader military culture of these populations all over Eurasia and beyond, right? Because much of also what existed in, in the West, in, in, in the ancient world, is to be directly connected with what we find of, uh, we, we think of chivalry in the Middle Ages, right? That was not another pack coming with the medieval millennium that never existed, by the way. But it, it was just a continuity with also tribal, ancestral, uh, religious and military ideas that were at the base, literally, of, of the uh, moral systems of all these people. Uh, in, in in much more homogeneous way than, than we think. So India is also relatively isolated because the best information we have uh, is from this uh, Western historiography. Uh, I mean, the, the most reliable. This this is in a way naturally what the the Greeks had uh, come to make the, the, the themselves distinguished from the rest of the world was spreading in in uh, in the rest of the Mediterranean. And uh, therefore, we start knowing also because of the Alexandrine uh, adventure, right, and, and dream of India, that was the single most important objective that he wanted to reach after the conquest of Persia, you know, in the securing, the attempt of securing the, this enormous conquests uh, achieved, uh, represents um, a bit of an exotic reality, but at the same time is, you know, described with a western critical and you know you can say almost scientific in the at least in the etymological sense of the world ideal that surely is biased that but still gives sometimes a, a better sometimes also a more technicistic uh, approach to what this uh, reality was and we get interesting information from there too uh, some still talking about the look of this Indian infantryman. Some Indians wore beards, uh, but were most uh, sh uh, shown, at least mostly shown, as clean shaven. The hair was usually long, often piled into a top knot, and it was tied with a strip of cloth, simple turban, sometimes decorated with a spherical ornament. Clothing also was quite simple a white cotton kilt reaching to mid calf usually gathered up at the front with uh, the ends of the cloth and um, of the sash used to fasten it hanging down. This could be quite ornate. We have also the beautiful Persian uh, reliefs, uh, uh, sculptures show, uh, depicting Indian tributaries in simple shorter kilts, right, quite evenly. Uh, this might have been uh, a local variation from the Achaemenid domains in the Punjab. The, the Achaemenids uh, objectively invaded uh, India as well. And um, sandals could be worn, but common soldiers are often shown barefoot, which already tells you uh, what is the average that we're looking at. India, as you know, was uh, already at the time overwhelmingly populated. Uh, it had this enormous agricultural resources. That's also why Alexander looked at it favorably. There were lots of Indians that actually were, were fairly good with an eventual uh, Alexandrian scenery. Uh, and the myth of Alexander which spread at many levels also in these areas. Um, and we're talking about um, realities, um, political and social realities, that uh, definitely were reaching important levels of centralization, but that for the average were fundamentally a bit a hybrid between the tribal uh, and uh, in fact more civilized reality uh, they were specifically you know uh, especially away from the great Indus and Ganges valleys uh, properly tribal areas right uh, also in the north in, towards the mountains but especially also think about the south that uh, the south of India was considered by the same northern Nurse as uncivilized, as more, as, as wilder in a way. We observed these things in um, in, the, in the video about the the, the Maurian military organization. Also considering the this uh, extensive uh, 
um, empires that a bit throughout all Indian histories, history were very difficult to maintain. Uh, just as most empires of the time were namely, but sp- that there was a specific instability in this enormous uh, set of communities that, generally speaking, tended to swallow any of the greatest uh, attempts of centralization. I mentioned Ashoka before because he objectively carried out this um, say social engineering attempt also creating a, a strongly um, a strong uh, centralized strongly centralized uh, police uh, after by the way one of the single most say bloodiest campaigns of expansions that ancient world has ever known right there was also this fact that uh, Shaka is considered at the pacifist the king that didn't want to use violence he he used violence extensively not just before but also and especially after his conversion it was just uh you know an excuse to to centralize but also this theory was not new um this theory of pacification was not new right this theory that uh, there were several uh, there were different uh, civilizations of uh, expansion uh, form, forms of expansion specifically recognized by in, in the Mar- in Marian culture at the time and also presumably uh, as far as I know at least predating this so this chivalric idea also of Aryan eco that at this point had spread largely that uh, were just uh, an excuse an hypocrisy right but they were based on objectively on the realization which stem from actual practice that uh, this enormous signories that at the end of the day the more the, the, even the Maurians were, who fundamentally were uh, had different shades of, of, of you know of subjugation of the of the Aries, of the Arab peoples just like you know the Alexandrian Empire the Roman Empire I mean it, it, as we've, we have said it many times these were not mo- modern nation states they function in very different ways with lots of client states so uh, there was the recognition that naturally also in here uh, earthly rule was fundamentally a, a divine, a military business. Uh, so there was a, a very serious attention towards the specific relations of power with the, uh, with the rulers and the dominated, the subjugated peoples. And this constant uh, problem of keeping the whole thing together, because the aristocracies were quite strong, um, the, the urban civilization existed since millennia, but it wasn't the only cultural reality existing all around. So, India, you know, a lot of things in India, over, you know, the long run do not last, right? And especially as far as conquerors are concerned, this is always how the 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 thing has gone. Uh, and uh, it's really a demographic reason in many ways, but not only, of course. Uh, but it's a bit of a leitmotiv in, uh, in Indian history. But as we're looking at the appearances, the equipment, we're talking these barefoot troopers are the the exemplification of a of a reality that in part existed also in, in the in the I don't know, in the Atlantic West, right? Uh, the idea of fighting barefoot. How why is it this detail important? Well because it tells you how, you know, apt to 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 even to living into a certain environment and a certain aptitude to, you know, contact nature in its various uh, contexts, even for armies here that were very large and very well organized, actually, um, refer of. Uh, just imagine, I don't know, the, the Romans not having their Caligae. Right, uh, we would miss something about it. Well, the Indian character here is uh, just like you know, even the Alexandrine pikemen had their own shoes. Uh, so uh, we're talking about a world that is advanced, but still, you know, not quite a world that is uh, civilized, but also tribal. Right. So uh, this very, very varied reality that India has always been, culturally, ethnically religiously and uh that made its strength at many levels and that refers also on the let's say on re- the relative um you know cheap cost of of lots of things that elsewhere uh were were dealt with differently one could say 
you know, easily think about the elephants. I mean, literally, the Indian rulers gave elephants, like, you know, like dim diplomatic gifts, right? Ask the Seleucids, uh, because they had to throw them away, right? For how much they had them. But even the single troopers, right? Sometimes were so many because these power, these rulers were were controlling so many people at once that even trying to in increase the quality of their equipment, for example, in a, a standardized or semi-standardized way, like you could find it, you know, among the Macedonians or the Romans, was useless, right? With mass, you could still do most of the thing. And this was not easy, of course. Also, we don't have to stress too much the comparison, but objectively, we do know these enormous armies that the Indians were capable of moving. And it wasn't just about the Maurians. It was, this was about every single polity that also somewhat escaped their, their control or was also autonomous within it. There were very important princes, principalities in the Punjab, for example, that mm, were were actually you know quite of a challenge for for the same for the same Macedonians. And that, in a way, were also more uh, westernized, we can't say. You know, uh, we have seen before of the Persian influence in India, but historically speaking, of course, these different areas of, I don't know, the Punjab is very different from Bengala, but I didn't have to, uh, you know, to, to explain why. Uh, so, the, 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 there was somewhat a frontier that, eventually, as you know, will also be the, the gate for other peoples. Think about the Sith Hellenic uh, Kingdom. In India, uh, this broader influences that has the the Vedic Aryans had come from you know from from uh, the Eurasian steppes in, into India be before right kept pouring also at some levels, and India was really what the the Alexandrian Empire would, would was about was the obsession of Alexander's what well, would be the obsession of the Romans. Augustus famously wanted to invade India. Doesn't matter that the, you know at the time they didn't have much of a geographical uh, awareness in a scientific sense of distances and so on, but the, the mere conquest of the place would have provided those empires an enormous amount of resources they could have spent in other ways. Naturally, it was very complicated, naturally, even just to reach it. But we know of this constant exchange. I mean, I don't know, in Malabars there were Roman temples, uh, at some point in Augustian times, a temple dedicated to Augustus specifically. We will talk about it maybe in another in another situation. Uh, other cultural, uh, I'd say, other elements. Men seemingly invariably wore earrings, right? While um, rankers, however, rarely wore much of other jewelry. Here there's also the problem of the, the social certification, status, prestige, and but. For, for now, we skip it because it's proper or other. Look at the Maurian Army Organization video for that. Uh, talking about the typologies, right? As we were saying before, today we don't talk about the armored troops, but we look fundamentally at the average trooper you could find, broadly speaking, in Indian armies. The commonest type seems to have been the archer. Before this, I should point out that talking about infantry that in the Maurian organization, uh, army organization, we have pointed out what seems to me a dramatically remarkable importance of cavalry in Indian warfare at this time, which I don't think is is usually pointed out, right? Let's leave aside the, uh, the, the nice elephants, but let's talk specifically about cavalry, the horse proper. Uh, the, there was in here all this Aryan ethos, of course, of equestrian combat, you know, the, of seniority, of aristocracy, of blood, of classes, of fierce divide uh, between this um, ferocious divide between the, this this social stance, uh, and therefore we have to think of this infantry naturally integrated in a system that had to cope with cavalry, and this is very, very, very important. And the fact that what seemingly seemed to have been the commonest type of infantryman as an archer in Indian warfare tells something very interesting about things like, uh, I can say what you can equally parallel to, I don't know, the English armies during the Hundred Years' War, but I mean the idea that an important missile power could be combined naturally with the stopping power of, of uh, melee infantry, quite of a challenge to cavalry as well. And the Indians fundamentally meant Longbows, 
right? It was this interesting bow tradition. The Indian bow was long, heavy, and powerful, made in bamboo. Uh, and it was long as the archer was tall, right? Literally, so this was... Uh, I don't think we have to digress here on the most obvious realization that the long bow, like all you know, war never existed as such, but they were just long bows because literally, uh, you know, there is no other distinction you can make. And that, of course, every weapon at the time was fundamental, and especially these ones who were fundamentally built uh, also and manned by, by everybody, or at least all who could bear arms, and produced, therefore, mostly on their own, in spite the, the naturally, the, the Maurians at a certain point tend to try to disarm as most seigneuries, right, and and to also standardize equipment for their troopers. But, you know, this was kind of a, I can say a national weapon, but it was so widespread that uh, it was something very common that most uh, Indian warriors uh, built and, you know, lived with, just as hunters and so on. Um, so it was this, it was a longbow, properly manned. So it required actually a hell of a strength to be drawn. It had a hemp of sinew string drawn to the ear, to the ear were loading. Arrows were three cubits, as far as the sources tell, long. Uh, so it's uh, three cubits is something like 137 centi uh, centimeters, right? And consider also the time people were kind of shorter, so uh, everywhere. So uh, that's, that's pretty long, uh, right? It's like, I think, four foot and six inches, something like that. In, in, and um, um, the, the, the arrows were made of cane or reed flighted with vulture feathers while the heads were usually in iron or sometimes in horn we also know of poisoned arrows being uh, occasionally mentioned uh, these were usually to be condemned as unethical especially by the Brahmin writers albeit Hellenic sources actually record the Brahmins themselves using poisoned arrows against Alexander. And, you know, poisoned arrows were somewhat, a, you know, depending, not, not as, a, as a standard, of course, because the, there are different, important differences on how you use uh, an arrow, which type it is, and so on. But, you know, they were pretty common in the ancient world altogether. Uh, as far as the use against Alexander is concerned, my my point is, of course, that Indians used uh, and the same Brahmins used actually uh, arrows against each other all the all the freaking time. They, they you see the, the concept at the base is that uh, uh, you know Aryan Edus that the it's it's the the the, the poisoned arrow is, is a cowardly thing. It's a bit like in the Germanic epos, like you know that the hero is always killed in a kind of a stupid way. Uh, mostly at the back and by a missile thing, or at least by something, you know, like a, you know, a really a cowardly fashion. Well, this is the same thing in the Indo-European uh, legacy uh, in India. But, uh, objectively, we may think that at this point the Indians had developed also a certain kind of, mm, uh, can say xenophobia probably meant, uh, but the idea that Alexander was a, a foreign invader right made it illicit to use like the worst uh, unethical means against him at least uh, from those that were fighting against him because here there was the problem naturally that all these powers were the, the maurians the, the you know the, Mas the yeah the, 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 the macedonians and so on were uh, were considering themselves universal rulers so there can't be more than one universal ruler which means that if you are the universal ruler anybody who's fighting against you is like a cockroach right uh, it, it's false so it's, it's unjust it's someone that does not deserve the, the military glory of the skies and this is exactly what they were thinking uh, arrows were kept in a long quiver worn vertically down the center of the back Suspensed by crossbills, uh, seemingly they were loaded uh, heavily in projectiles, and uh, archers on the central reliefs. That here I've put uh, 
you know diffusely in in the in the pictures show um uh basically archers with with handfuls of arrows kept ready in their right hands as well right so this uh doesn't have perhaps much of a significance like artistical licenses are always out there uh but of course there's nothing about having you know uh nothing strange about thinking an indian archer that keeps some arrows in his hands rather than in the quiver because presumably also the way that they, these were shot in certain instances at least could be you know very very quickly one after the other i mean we don't know they weren't also just long bows right so here it's uh we don't have to be workamistic about it uh and on the contrary we can't think that the more the better in the sense that probably archery was really uh a thing out there so there were very different types of, of uh, very many different types of, of using it in different contexts as much as in India you, you could find we are uh, on this reliefs we also see a leather bracer worn over, over the left arm plus some kind of finger protection perhaps on the um, on archers ring for the right th uh, thumb we understand that the Indian bow was very powerful. Aryan states that no shield or cuirass could stop its arrows, but it did not apparently meet with unqualified approval from Alexander's officers. Also, Cursus says bow and arrow were too heavy to be accurately aimed, which, in my opinion, makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, or, in any case, Considered that what the majority of bows have been used like historically speaking were not to you know for for accuracy right they were fundamentally used for making volume of fire towards mass of enemies so uh I think it's ridiculous to even just imagine that India for some reason didn't produce you know accurate bows that could should you know arrows or even precisely uh, and it may simply refer to the fact that uh, the Indian archers were brought en masse to essentially saturate the air with this enormous mass of arrows thrown all together and we know how this was basically the thing uh, in most even ancient medieval warfare contexts right you know what matters is not precision is throwing the volleys uh, all together to you know maintain this the space in the battle and uh, to act as as one so that at every salvo let's say you you inflict this concentrated harm that is higher over the, against the, the enemies uh, for for the enemy's cohesion that uh, to bear then you know the same amount of arrows but you know scattered di diluted in uh, as if every archer did whatever the the heck he liked independently from his formation so these are statements for, for from sources like courses that you know we don't have to take literally uh, not even as you know reliable bro broadly meant right it's, uh, there is surely an importance in the information given but it can be easily interpreted also in this sense and both he and Arian record that the bow had to be braced with the left foot when firing. This is also, you know, a bit strange. Curtis even adds that the muddy footing at the Battle of the of the Daspis hindered this uh, movement, thus contributing to the Indian defeat against Alexander. But uh, this is at least thrown in doubt by by Arian, who states that the the main battle was fought on firm dry ground right so we're talking about i mean accounts of uh you know what is courses like first second century ad so almost like uh, half of a millennium later so we have to understand here what the, what the hell we're even talking about and uh but it's still an interesting indication that the bracing with the foot that these two sources describe uh, is not shown in indian art for example uh, the, the the conventional uh, images 
portrayed the, the, this as we've seen before the the bowman pulling the string to the, to, to to his ear standing foot having nothing to do with that um, and uh, which is also by the way uh, the perhaps the only way such a powerful weapon could be could be used in the first place uh, also consider that putting the bow against the foot would lead the, the arrow pointing downwards at some point unless you're not crouched oh, which is something that no source even describes so this is a good example of how the, the, the also ancient historiography must be you know at, at least critically approached then the, the, every interpretation is is debatable but let's be sensible about certain topics perhaps what may have hampered the, the bow's use was the, the the power itself right the fact that it was mm, you know strong uh, over time we know for example the battle of, of the daspas itself that um Poros army was deploying hurriedly from column of march when the main battle started right and some of his archers may still have been struggling to string their bows when the Macedonians attacked. Hmm? That's that's to consider. Another main type of Indian warrior could be here a javelin man. Nearchus states that uh, these troops carried a light shield of robe ox hide. It was nearly as long as the wielder, but not as broad. This is also fascinating because it sounds very much like an extra form of protection while under fire, right? These contexts where archery was particularly important, you can see it in, among the Assyrians. In a way, even during the Middle Ages, in part, you know, always developed this kind of larger shields than the other, especially those who could. Uh, these are skirmishers here, so they're not specifically hand-to-hand -hand fighters, at least not necessarily, uh, especially in open ground. Actually, on the hilly ground, also, in, uh, you know, uh, of India, there was plenty of troopers that just as what was the, the ancient world's average, fought fundamentally as skirmishers slash, yeah, melee combatants. So there was surely something in between, especially in certain areas. But the fact that the uh, the shield was so tall, more than else, speaks for the specific uh, function of defense, right, of the entire body line up to the head. And this sounds very much like a protection, mostly from projectiles, right? Not that this didn't help them had they had to combat with some someone else hand to hand. Of course it did, but also it would probably function a bit in a different fashion. After all, we don't rarely get such high shields in most uh, contexts. And when they are, think about the Tureos that, however it didn't quite reach literally the, the entire height. Um, the the Turios of probably the Celtic troops, because the the, the one who was eventually uh, mutuated by the Hellenes, or at least actually in Greece it already existed conceptually as a form. So even the names here should be, I mean, since centuries. So, But let's not stress the, the, the mechanistic problems, because those are wrong, generally speaking, uh, in the first place. But they, they tended also to be larger, right? So the fact that they were so longilinear, uh, it's also, yeah, for a skirmisher that has to run a lot, well, large shields are not good. So this probably was a compromise between speed and protection for essentially someone who had to run, and to hit and run, most. And it, it kind of makes sense, right? Um, the also the hawk's hide is relatively light, right? And Indian sources also mention shields of hide, peti or karma, cane and leather, the kitika, perhaps leather on a cane framework, and wood, the astikarna. Uh, this is interesting also considering all the firepower we've seen before with bows, etc. Because this sounds very much like, um, you know, we don't find troops that seem to be so heavily 
defended from missile fire, which is something that, uh, as, as far as I've seen, may be connected. I mean, of course, there were, especially these wood uh, shields, the were that, of course, were quite protective and so on. But the fact they were just a type, and the most of these troopers were lighter, I think it connected with what I've seen on the Maurian army organization, eventually, as we'll see in the video about tactics, uh, were connected to a four uh, uh, position of cavalry. Right? In fact, we know that normally bowmen were deployed behind it. This is important because it sounds uh, like... Um, you know, as in other tactics, you know, uh, essentially, uh, where cavalry was central in a way, a port of missiles on, on the rear, but especially on the wings, right, sounds pretty much functional to these realities with a, not a direct protagonism of the infantrymen. Let's remember here that uh, most of these troops are not even properly, I mean, the case system sometimes was bypassed. We have seen it in the military organization of the Maori, right? Of course, it was this this thing, but in case of, of war, like even the Romans sometimes armed slaves for the sake of military emergency. So uh, India was so messed up at so many levels that at, at one point it was just a matter of getting enough manpower. And most of these troopers, as you realize, are pretty light, right? And probably... Yeah, they, they earned their their place next to their masters, the noblemen, uh, but they were still considered as inferiors, which is something not so different from also what you see in feudal societies and Middle Ages and so on. I insist on this because I repeat that I presume actually that M Maurian tactics heavily relied on cavalry, much more than is usually uh, believed. And naturally, this heavy, uh, you know, this this uh, rain of, of missiles could could be quite effective, especially the, the the one from the bows, could be quite effective to disrupt uh, a cavalry charge, because we don't have evidence of much horse armor, by the way, um, in 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 India, as well, more than in other areas, right? Here we don't see cataphracts, even though they surely were, right? And not even just uh, in the Indo-Scythian uh, period. Uh, the the sh uh, the shields at and the Sancho reliefs are not of Nearchus type though, right? But they're shorter and broader. Surprise, surprise! The Indians portray themselves using shields that are substantially uh, more similar to what used by others, other other peoples around. Yeah, because. It's not that there, there are even many ways to make a shield, right? And the, the sake is still protecting mostly your torso where most of the vital organs are, and then as far as the head was concerned, and the helmet or whatever. But even in here, probably most Indian infantry was devoid of any armor. And this is, this is also important. Imagine here, I repeat it, enormous land estates governed by aristocracy and the rest enormous amounts of peasants. So that that's perfectly fitting, especially in the most advanced areas of India, right, where exactly the aristocracies had more power, the hierarchies were stronger and so on. Then, of course, if you go towards the, the tribal areas, the forest, the mountains, um, in the north, in the south, you find ever more instead something similar to what you could find in all this infinite uh, amounts of peoples that the Greeks would, in, in arms, would call just the... the, the the Tureoforoi, right? Because they, they were essentially it. They, was, they were the standard type of trooper in the whole ancient war. Just a guy with uh, two or three uh, javelins slash spears, because basically they are the same thing and used interchangeably in that function. Small oval shield and basically no arm. That's it. That's what you find. And that, that's, that's essentially what a tribesman usually is, right? So here we generalize widely because... We cannot descend in every single historical, uh, you know, context, and not even in any single Indian reality of the, of the time. But the, the, believe me, the standards are this pretty much everywhere. The pattern of, of the shield could considerably represent strengthening bars of or the cane framework of a kitika, 
in this relief spot. This is made less likely by the resemblance to patterns on standards that are to be seen in the same iconography. And shields uh, decorated with sun, moon and stars are also described. And spears were mm, uh, also in here bearing. There, there wasn't really a. There, there was probably a standard length by sheer use, but there were also longer types from the second AD reliefs at Amaravati. Right, there is a longer weapon with three pronged head, perhaps the trisula, uh, which the texts speak. So here you see you have even to rely on, I don't know, something that. It was half of a millennium later, even just iconographically speaking. But we know that, yeah, Indian military technology didn't change much uh, after all. Uh, the Art, uh, Arta Sastra mentions an old iron spear, Sakti, four cubits long, that is 180 centimeters, six feet. Uh, with leaf-shaped head and blunt butt. Right. Uh, this is also interesting. Then we have also from uh, sculptures at Barut from the second century BC the figure of a, of a dress that has raised questions about the identity of, of the figure wearing it because the guy has this usual Indian kilt, but also unusual heavy boots and tight, long-sleeved jacket with braided edges. He doesn't have earrings, he wears his hair short, which is contrary to Indian custom. But this is not unique, because we have an armed gatekeeper from Sanchi, who is uh, without earrings, but at least wears the usual Indian dress. Um, there was an Indian tribe of the northwestern hills, the Cambodia, who were called shaven headed because they, are, they were barbarously uh, short haired, in fact, and for Indian standards. And this uh, probably uh, means that they, they weren't, however, completely shaved, because, for example, the, the Greeks were also called shaven headed, right? And they, uh, they, they also had in part uh, there. So uh, the men's boot and sleeves uh, also suggest a colder northern mountain climate. This would explain his allogen hairstyle, let's say. Uh, maybe a mix of Indian and an unorthodox dress. Herodotus mentions, for example, northwestern Indians uh, having customs resembling those of the Bactrians, which would suit sleeve tunics like this. Then we have interesting information about swords uh, that are properly those from Indian and Persian evidence. Nearchus says that all Indian infantry carried one is pro probably uh, this exemplified by the sources that had a very broad blade and was three cubits long. We've seen the same length of the bows, 137 centimeters. It was used for powerful two-handed cutting blows. This is interesting because two-handed swords are fair, pretty pretty rare um, in ancient warfare to, to, to find. And it was intended mostly for cutting blows, right? Brought down from above the head. And Given the structure of the blade, it seems clear also that this uh, was like a, a falchion, right? A, a big falchion mostly used to, to chop a lot. And a lot of unarmored opponents, which, if you think about it, in Indian warfare is, uh, as we've seen, was the norm. So even, even a relatively uh, lightly armored uh, infantryman... Uh, from the elite, let's say. So these troops were probably like the, the Zweihänder, like they could, you know, open these dramatic gaps into the, uh, the, the, the the enemy lines by just by cutting through them. W this will be more clearer when we talk about the armored Indian infantrymen. Uh, that, however, wasn't dramatically armed. 
you know, heavily armored as well. Because probably that would, you know, that, that few was was enough. And we don't have to think about it as a spear or a bow were, were less insidious than this. But still, we find this specific type of, of sword that was carried by um, a pretty large scabbard, as you understand as much as the, the blade was, worn f uh, from a baldric over the right shoulder and the ends of the baldric pass several times around the scabbard and are sometimes knotted at the end. And albeit Nearchus says that all infantry carried this sword, uh, it is in fact not universal in Indian art. And we can rightfully think that actually relatively few troops were armed with it. Uh, as well as the Baruth trooper, uh, it, it, it is carried by Indian tributaries in Persian sculpture and by one soldier at Sanchi, right? But most of the Sanchi figures have shorter swords uh, that were more similar just, I don't know, in shape to, to, to the Hellenic Xiphos, just to make you understand roughly what they were. That with a broad spoon-ended blade, we could say, and it is usually wielded in one hand, but can occasionally be used in two as well. The Art, uh, Artasastra speaks of um, three swords types, specifically. One is the Mandalagara, straight with a round tip. Then the Nistrim, uh, Nistrimsam, with a curved tip. The Asi, Asi with a uh, long and thin. And the Mandalagara is obviously of the type uh, we, we observe in these sources. The Nistrims uh, instead has been variously identified uh, but if, if its curved tip is to be distinguished from the Mandalagra's round one it must indicate uh, forward curved swords modeled on the Atlantic corpus more than else. Also with the single uh, cutting edge uh, which uh, became quite popular in India and in fact still exists in the form of the uh, Gurkha Kukri right and this weapon also as we know was uh, you know at least as a, as a form as a line w was important even in, on horseback this would suggest naturally a prolonged contact with Hellenic arms but we have also to um, to to refer to the fact that this this blades also were pretty much uh, widespread since even earlier times, uh, there is a general affiliation from from earlier forms from Egypt, and so so it's it's not specific, specifically to be regarded as an Hellenic influence, uh, nor that it was adopted specifically because of Hellenic contact with the, the Hellenes. But of, of course, it can. It surely, at some point, was intro you know there were types introduced by Hellenic or Hellenized cultures. Some authors have gone so far as saying that the Artasastra can be dated uh, after the Hellenic invasion of the second century. Uh, the, maybe it's excessive, but um, this would leave also the Asiasi, uh, which could be the, the big two-handed though calling this thin seems odd, right? And Asi is a common word for sword in the Mahabharata, where there is also the Mahasi, that is the great Asi variant, um, perhaps appropriate for the two-hander. And Indian swords were of good steel, right? Uh, this is a tradition that India would maintain over time, as you know, think about the votes, you know, the things improved naturally over time. Um, it uh, it usually had horn hilt, horn ivory or wood or bamboo uh, root hilts. Scabbards could be of cowhide, goat skin or tiger skin even, which sometimes I think it's showed also in the in some in some shields hide. And other weapons could include club or mace that it you know in the ancient world was actually a common weapon in, in many contexts uh, it was also carried by epic heroes 
uh, of whom, for whom maze fighting was a highly developed art. And as you know, there are many areas all over Eurasia where you know the club fencing is uh, almost a national sport, and everybody trained with a club back in the day. Roman legionaries, it's a, you know, it was a it's a very good exercise. Um, the club is cheap. Uh, it's um, symmetrical. I mean, it doesn't uh, need much of a train, uh, you know, a specific art to, to be employed, but it's still very effective. With training, it becomes even more. It has this uh, dramatic smashing uh, capability. We know of Alexander himself being attacked by a Malian club, and his officers described the, the Sibi of the Punjab using clubs. Uh, they were probably made of wood bound with metal, right? Uh, we, as we get from the Amaravati sculptures, probably, um, and others were instead faceted with iron heads, which you know, it's even it's even worse at some level. Uh, others were decorated with gold, so there was a prestige attached to the club that was used by the, the poorest as well as for, from the, the richest. It was a mythical weapon, a uh, symbol of power in many ways. Also, considering that the club is technically what you would use to, to smash the, the most armored troopers. Um, so that's also what the, the prestige historically derives from in many, many cultures. So you have to get close and you have to be effective with, you know, against armor with the trauma underneath it. Axes are also used. The Arta Sastra mentions stones as well, both hand hurled and forced links, while the Mahabharata mentions hildmen using stones. This has been also a pretty uh, common weapon. Uh, we don't have any specific. Uh, reference to uh, you know a s specialization of Indian infantry uh, as slingers but there is no reason to think that the, the weapon was popular in the subcontinent as elsewhere uh, especially among herdsmen to protect their charges from wild beasts and, and also since uh, the ammo was freely available in the Hill country and it it could have been used occasionally also in battle, but that's a pretty universal thing. And uh, in fact, uh, it, it was, I mean, aside from just in ancient warfare, we have specific uh, nationalities even that made use of this link as specialists apparently. But the 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 point is that the link was much more spread than than it often. Uh, seems it's just that the troops that normally employed it were not necessarily so professionally oriented. So, actually, those would have been some of the weakest troops around, just like the Psiloi. You know, the the term in Greek was known as the Sphendoneta, and these are to be found pretty much, pretty much everywhere. And you don't stop an army with those. Uh, not even uh, arrows can, or not even javelins can. So, naturally, these were less important troops that usually the the, the sources do, do not talk about because what's what's the point right it's already a big deal if they talk about you know the other you know the main units the main uh, specialties and so on and uh, that's not what what really makes the difference or so so important but anyhow this is just like a picture of of the equipment mostly uh, we could add more, but frankly, I think the, the 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 more we generalize at certain levels, the 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 better it is, right? Um, because we we don't have uh, first of all much evidence, but also no much reason to to think that the essentials differed. After all, uh, uh, infantry was plenty of in India, and uh, just for uh, demographic reasons. And there was uh, also the need of them in certain specific realities, not just outside of the pitch battles in planes, etc., where presumably cavalry had the upper hand, uh, at least in certain, certain contexts. And we'll talk more about the armored uh, one, the heavier infantry at some point, that probably had, the, in fact, the, 
the first role there, but um, specifically also for sieges. Think about the many cities that uh, you know existed in, in India already at the time. If you're on a siege, you you necessarily need infantry to to enclose the wall perimeter and so on. And naturally, all these other more tribal uh, troopers at the outskirts of the great valleys, the great plains, and uh, that were simply more skilled to, uh, on, on this hilly ground and so on, where, where infantry naturally has uh, a greater importance. So I would leave it really like this, and for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents, and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.